welcome to the uh, the seventh and final uh, in installment of the visiting designer speaker series. Which is really incredible um, time. I just I want to start by um, just thanking all of you. It's really been an incredible honor speaking with all of you individually. Um, and I know our, our students really have enjoyed it and gotten a lot out of it. Um, so thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I also just wanna quickly thank some of the people that helped make this possible, uh, starting with uh, Bart Bland in the, um, the art gallery. He, um, he spoke with uh, Kayla and I uh, a couple weeks ago now. Um, Deborah Yazinski is also in the gallery. She's been helping out managing all this stuff behind the scenes. Uh, I also want to thank the people who helped introduce our speakers, Deb, uh, uh, President Lemons, uh, Provost Mosu, Dean Mann, Professor Towery in the Arts Department. And I lastly just want to thank Dorothy Dunn at the Sarah Little Turnbull Foundation, who's been really supportive of us throughout this time and, and very patient. So, uh, And also asking really great questions. Uh, so thank you so much, Dorothy. Um, Today is gonna to be really special because we're not really necessarily focusing on any one topic. Um, I've asked all the guests that we've had over the past six weeks to come all talk together. I'm gonna to take a, a back seat and they're basically gonna culminate the whole, the whole series. Um, I'd like to, I'd actually just like to ask our first speaker in the series, Laura Silva. She's the VP of accessibility at Bank of America to serve as our moderator. And I also just wanna welcome back Isan, Fabiana, Clavon, Kayla, and Sarah. They're all here before us. Uh, and um, you know, before I pass it off, I just want to um, just say that you feel free to ask any questions during, during the panel. Uh, we'll do our best to answer them and kind of maybe roll, the, roll them into the conversation if it makes sense. So uh, Laura, I'll start with you. Um, it's really been quite a ride since we began. This is now like in the beginning of October, if you can believe it. Um, and as Asan said, when, in, when we, in, we had his talk, he said that this is an incredibly uh, diverse group of designers and they all have really distinct visions about what design is and what it should be and who should be included in it, et cetera, which is really the whole point of this entire series to begin with. Um, but I was wondering if you noticed any commonalities that stood out amongst all of you. Yes, let me see. I am I am on not a mute for the first time <laughs> today. Uh, hi guys, hello, hello. Um, once again, thank you, Dave, for for bringing me to moderate this panel. I am very much honored to to just serve as a as a translator, pretty much. I'm here to showcase the panelists and, and their amazing perspectives um, and to represent, you know, uh, Latinas and Latin people in tech. Um, well, what I noticed about this panel, which, and from the conversation that, that the theory has had throughout, uh, is something that I really want people to really understand that diversity is not monolithic. Right, diversity is is means something for everyone individually um, and collectively. Uh, as we work together to make everyone's reality of what diversity is, that's when how we create an inclusive design uh, environment and inclusive work and inclusive atmosphere in this space. I think that's that's the goal, right? Uh, understanding what each individual needs and what each individual aspired. And, and I think that one perspective, it, there, it, it, the perspective that, um, you know, kind of like I represent this uh, group of people because those group of people also have very much different tests amongst themselves, right? I think that something that we noticed pretty much throughout the last, you know, events that's been going on in the United States, we noticed that you know, uh, Latinos don't think the same, they don't vote the same, they don't have the same necessities, same thing as black people, uh, same thing as white people and, and indigenous. We just need to make sure that we understand that um, diversity has to be diverse. And I think with that, it's a very good segue 
to start our conversation. And as you guys know, I like to just go in, let's go at it. We don't need to out here be nice. We're all friends, we're all family out here. So what I'm going to ask the, the panelists is, I'm gonna ask you guys a, a question, but I really would like you guys to just reintroduce yourself, give us your name, um, uh, how it's meant to be said, and, and just your, your title before answering the question. And this question goes to everyone in the panel, uh, feel free to jump in. So what does inclusive design means to you? Let's begin with that one. Anyone can start. I can start. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. My name is uh, Sarah Carr. I'm an assistant professor of architecture, urbanism, and landscape at Northeastern University. So I am an architect um, and an urban designer. My research looks at the intersection of built environment and urban health um, and understanding how design can hopefully be um, supportive in all aspects of health. Um, I've been thinking a lot about inclusive design and of course in architecture it means very literal things, right? It's a lot of times it's very uh, literal in terms of like accessibility, right? <laughs> Sometimes we, I think we've thought of that as a ramp and, and now we're having a lot of hard but very long coming and necessary discussions to think about how inclusive design is actually making people feel welcome in the spaces um, that we design and how we incorporate the viewpoints and so for me um, at least in my field, I, I feel like we're at the start of talking about what a truly inclusive design is. And I would say right now, um, it's just about making the space for that perspective and understanding how people, how people feel um, in the spaces that they inhabit or maybe spaces they don't feel um, included in. I love that. I love that. It's beginning the conversation. And, and I think one part of we don't realize that architecture is part of design and, and inclusive architecture is a thing, right? It, I mean, we, we focus, like you said, on accessibility, but it goes beyond just, does it have a ramp? Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> I, love, I love that fact. Um, anyone else to jump in on your definition of inclusive design based on your space? I, I will. Can you hear me? Yes. So um, my name is Clayvon Lowe. I'm an industrial designer, uh, design director at Green Touch Home. And um, my definition of inclusive or the way I look at inclusive is um, giving the people that you're working with or the people who you're impacting a voice. So inclusion um, involves providing a voice to others or giving others a voice to me in the space that I'm in. I love that. I can go next. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Fabiana Rodriguez, and I am joining you from um, Ohlone Territory, uh, also known as Oakland, California. And um, I am a artist, and I have a, a studio, um, and I also direct a national organization called the Center for Cultural Power. And to me, inclusive design means really just getting into um, right relationship with how people participate. I, I think that like white supremacy has centered white people for hundreds of years. And so it's like now we need to undo it and actually center all people and just be responsive to their needs um, and actually include them at the table. Uh, and I, to me, it's really, you know, as an environmentalist, I see it as us having returning to biodiversity. And that means that we, nature is biodiverse and as people we're diverse and to get into right relationship with our diversity means that we are no longer moving in a monoculture kind of way which is what is the the, the dominating system is a monoculture and it's just done it doesn't it's it's so clear that it's it hasn't been working and and it won't continue to work um so i think it's it's actually um it, it it's getting into like uh, the correct relationship with um with who we are as as people I love that. It's fix, fixing the mistakes that we didn't know were mistakes at the beginning. And I think based on, you know, adding what Sarah and what Clavon said is, is, is uh, letting the people who haven't been heard uh, 
uh, are be the one who who give the guidelines of how those mistakes should be fixed, right? I think that's I, I love I love that part. Um, Kayla, it's on. Yes. Awesome. Um, my name is Kayla Coleman. Um, I'm the deputy director of Percent for Art, um, a unit in the Department of Cultural Affairs here in New York City, and we commission public art for the city, um, all five boroughs. Um, it's an interesting um, experience as this is, you know, a government process um, as well as, you know, a design process. And for me, I think that inclusive design is, or what makes inclusive design worthwhile is, for me, is being willing to do the work and like the work that goes into inclusivity, I believe is not just making space for um, other point of views and you know other you know abilities, but also being you know able and being willing to honor those things like you know those differences and create space for them, um, and you know also be willing to put perspectives that aren't yours um, to the forefront. I love that. Yeah, it's like let's let's start thinking like let's start thinking that there is not one center, right? Yes. The, the, the view shouldn't be centristic. That uh, I mean, it's a combination. Uh, we're talking about monolithics, right? It's not. This is not what design. Design is not monolithic. And if we have thought a bit about it that way, it's time, right, to put in the work and start unlearning the things that we didn't know were wrong to begin with. I love that opportunity. Um, Esan, it's your turn to share with us. What is your sure. perspective of what inclusive inclusive means to you? Sure, yeah. Tough, tough question to answer. Um, I know, that's me. how I like it. That's yeah. how I like it. <laughs> yeah, so hi, everyone. My name is uh, Esan Nursalhi. I'm an Iranian-American uh, product designer in San Francisco. Um, and right now I work for a company called Samsara who does um, industrial IOT devices. Um, so different sensors you can plug into like vehicles and factories and, and things like that. Um, and so I, I think right now in my career, I don't get to actively at, at least in my day job work on trying to answer the, this question. And so as a, as a side project, I've tried to think about, you know, it's really sort of almost prompted by like a show like Black Mirror or, you know, th those kinds of things of like, every time I watch that, I'm so afraid of where tech is going and, you know, how extractive it can be and, and sort of figuring out like how, how can this future tech um, that I work on, um, how can it sort of like bend towards, you know, the right arc of, of being for humans. Uh, that, that, but that's very, very generic. Uh, but I, I think in a previous life, uh, before I was so much in tech, I, I got a chance to work on prosthetic technology for, for developing world. Um, and for me there, it meant, you know, not falling for the trap of, uh, there's this phrase like white man savior complex. Like that, the thing that we always fall for is like, okay, we're, we're in a good situation. We're going to go help the people that are in a bad situation. Uh, and I think oftentimes what I've seen is when we try to do things that are about diversity, it's someone in a position of power trying to prescribe what the solution should be uh, and not really understanding what the problem is and, and, and actually helping solve that. Um, so that, that takes a lot of effort. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of times when I see diversity in the workplace, it feels like it's trying to like push a quick fix uh, or hire some person of color. And that's not actually doing anything to, to fix any problems. Okay, we're getting feisty out here with our answers. I like it. All right, let's get, let's get, let's get to it. I think, I think you brought up a, a very awesome uh, perspective and, and, and it's, it's literally on my talking point, which is, um, and you brought two things. And I think this will be a great opportunity to start this conversation again. Um, on the work that we do, uh, in, individually and and sometimes not even in design it could be anyone who's right now listening uh, that might not be in a design centric uh, space um how do they uh, be part of the change into inclusive into inclusivity 
um, even if they're not part of design, like like right now what you're saying, right? You're not working on something that has to do with inclusive design, but just your perspective makes it inclusive because you're bringing who you are into the work um, and who you are doesn't represent what we think about the norm. Uh, so I would really love to, to get the panelists uh, perspective on how do we um, help people understand that no matter what space of their the work the workplace they are or, or what their career might be they can also think about inclusive and inclusive and inclusive design inclusivity and inclusive design uh, to put into their work whichever that might be that this is an open whomever want to to get a jab at it. So I think I think um, this is Fabiana again. I think that first um, to get into inclusive design, I think there's particular um, kind of core pillars that people have to understand first, and 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 that is to understand how white supremacy and colonialism has affected people in, in this in this land base, but really all over the world. Um, I think it's really important for people to educate themselves because unfortunately for a lot of us, we didn't get education in school around what oppression looks like. I think a lot of us are learning as we go and we don't necessarily have the language to be able to articulate sometimes what's happening. Um, we're getting the language now, like, you know, now with books like White Fragility, um, there's so many books on race that actually allows us to talk about what's what's happening um, and, and not just race, but also gender inclusion, uh, including people of all abilities. So I think first it's important for people to be grounded in um, understanding how these systems work because to get into inclusive design and actually any work of inclusion mm -hmm. really requires to, it's a lifelong journey to undo these systems. That's what we're doing. We're, we're, we're partly undoing, but we're also creating. Cause I, yeah. I also don't think that you know, as an artist and a creator, I spend like 30 of my percent, 30 percent of my time correcting the old stuff and 70 percent of my time creating the future. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think that we have to dissolve some systems, but we also got to build new systems. Um, and the way we do that is by grounding ourselves in knowledge. Right. Like understanding, OK, you know, Am I being aware of indigenous culture in my work? If not, how do I do that? Um, am I, um, you know, including all genders? Um, do I have relationships with people of all genders or not? Right? Like, how do I, how do I understand the difference between interpersonal racism and institutional racism? So I think once you have that grounding, then it becomes easier for you to actually do inclusion work. I think inclu inclusive design is actually inclusion work, which mm -hmm. is basically about, okay, how do, I, how do I change this? I change it by naming it, recognizing it and naming it, and then proposing a possible intervention, right? And so that could be like, you know, as an artist, I am going to um, make sure that the people I collaborate with, I'm gonna make sure that I'm, collaborating with like transgender content creators, right? So I think it's about um, understanding first, having your core knowledge, and then thinking about how little by little you can begin to undo these systems by testing out your own ideas, you know, like just taking a risk and figuring out um, what kind of impact you may have that will help undo the, the old stuff. I love that perspective, for sure. On on trying to uh, have a definition between before you even jump into it. Um, but I think I think that that brings that that might tell people, okay, do I need to spend, you know, months and months reading books before I can actually do anything about it, uh, or or can I do can I undo the work while learning at the same time? Is I think that. That, that's one thing that, for example, has been brought up to me a lot. It's like, I don't, this is too big for me to know all of it, but I still want to do, you know, my work uh, in this space. I still want it to be inclusive. So how do I, how do I do that? And I would love anyone in the panels, if they have any idea of, of how to, 
to level up, balance it out. I, I think at the, um, just at the core of good design is problem solving and within problem solving you have to be considerate of others and care for others and care to solve issues that aren't your own um and i think it just comes like the inclusive part of that becomes the 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 task of solving problems for other people you know um, in order to do that you have to be inclusive you have to listen to other people and take them into consideration um, I've seen a lot of great designers not make it as far due to egos. And I, th I think, you know, within design, I know within ID, oftentimes there, there may be ego issues which can get in the way of, of great designers. But I think that um, in order to be a, a really, a truly well-rounded great designer, you must be inclusive and you must be considerate of solving problems and issues for other people. Yeah, I think Clavon, you made me think about something interesting, which is like problem solving. And like, what does problem solving mean? Because I think also problem can sometimes be trying to problem solve too quickly uh, without mm -hmm. understanding what's really going on. Um, and, you know, I think that's really what we're talking about, right? Is like really understanding. I think one of the challenges is that anytime someone is in a position of power uh, they're sort of blindsided by like what, what's really going on. It's really hard to understand the problems. Uh, and I think that's like at all levels, right? Like in society or in a workplace or in a team, if there's like a leader. So I think it's like a real challenge of like, I'm actually sort of don't like to be in positions where I'm the leader. I'm in charge of like other people because I feel like it actually gets in the way of problem solving. Um, so I, I personally have like struggled to sort of figure out you know, what, what's the best way? Because when you're a leader and you have a position of power, you can maybe solve a problem, but you're, you're blind to what the problem is. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, especially in architecture and urban planning, we definitely have a fraught relationship with the idea of problem solving because it's caused so much destruction, especially to black and brown and indigenous communities um, over the years, right? Because it's seen as an efficiency problem or it's seen as an aesthetic problem. Um, I teach a class right now where we are looking at the intersection of environmental racism and environmental justice now in East Boston. Um, and I think what we've actually found and talking a lot to, um, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, we kind of had to rethink the skills that we were teaching in the class. Um, and, you know, one thing we, my colleague, the, uh, Jay Cephas, who I'm co-teaching with, that we were really adamant about is we wanted to tell the students they were going to be proposing their own thesis project, but it was not to solve a problem, right, but rather it was, um, Jay had a great term for it, which is for the first thing we had to do was surface knowledge, right, and try and understand like what the inherent qualities of the place were, where are the people, um, and considering like everything else about our teaching was blown up this fall, like <laughs> everything else, we just decided to build this idea of the architecture studio again from the ground up and instead of teaching students how to um, design which they still are what we're actually doing is teaching them how to interview they've been interviewing environmental activists in um, in east boston um, they've been learning how to read surveys and what the ethics are uh, around that and um, it's been I, I wouldn't say it's been a smooth ride the students keep saying like okay when are we going to design something <laughs> when are we going to design something but we've actually found that it was necessary to, to teach them these these skills first. Um, and it's, you know, it's not something I learned in architecture school. It's something that came afterwards in practice and realized that there are actually all these, there are all these skills and the, these ethics around interviewing and there's all these skills around analyzing the interviews afterwards. And I think that's what we're trying to do with our students now and, and let them know there are actually all these other like hard skills you need to, to learn all, along with design. That, that's a that's a very interesting perspective because um, I'm in the space of UX design, uh, but I focus uh, my focus is on ac accessibility, right? Of making sure that people with different disabilities um, and abilities are able to use the the spaces that we design um, as anyone else. And the part that I notice the most is um, uh, assumption of problems. 
and lack of of research and interviews or 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 putting even even sometimes also putting um numbers over anecdotes uh and and percentages over actual quotes and comments and and and, and giving a, a value on numbers even higher sometimes than someone's actual experience and 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 storytelling of it um and so i love the fact that that right now there's a little bit of shift into the human before we actually put the paper or the building or the brick is actually understanding what what is needed and and so we, we start realizing I, I i love the audience to notice how we're, we're starting to to give you guys a roadmap on how to be more inclusive into your work right we're, we're telling you guys to to ask questions to be well first we're telling you go read a book <laughs> or listen to an audiobook and inform yourself on on the perspective of other people and and sometimes maybe your own biases and your own limitations and understand you know the the foundation of the space that you are and then we're telling you guys all right let's let's um gather some data let's let's understand from the people that you're going to be impacting let's get their perspective first before you uh putting your own perspective or your own need as as Ezra said before you centered yourself put other people's and and their needs first and i love how we're trying to give you guys the roadmap right the blueprint on on how to become a little more inclusive in your space and but i i wanted then to to continue this to understand what do you guys think is is lagging in design education uh in the different areas as that we are or, or in education period right uh to allow students to have the tools before they come out of the work and i have to you know just really i mean we're always learning right but i think it's important to arm our our students and and the generation coming up with the tools that they're really going to need um so i really would love to know what are the what are the subjects the tools the the design ideas that you guys think should be taught or or a uh, focus in the work so that the next generation uh does a little better than what we have done <laughs> um i'd love to jump in and start that discussion um i think personally for me i always try to operate in a position of like being teachable you know what don't i know there's so much i don't know and i could read you know so many books and you know try to engage so many different communities but there's always going to be something that i don't know and making my peace with that you know as as we you know if you are someone who has you know gone through academia and you know having these relationships with people in the real world whatever knowing that you don't know something and always you know being in this position of like humility and humbleness and knowing that every moment is a teachable moment mm -hmm. so um being having that willingness and that's not to say that there won't be something that you will know there's a lot of things that i feel like that you know i have a good grasp on however i know that you know that's just my one perspective and there could be someone else with a different approach and so whenever you know i am you know doing the work that i do i number one think you know this is a service so in, i always consider inclusivity as work for others like you know yes it will help me too but you know being having you know the collective good in you know my forebrain helps me you know stay in the service mode and know that this is bigger than me all of this work is bigger than me and it will serve so many people and in order to do that it can't just be you know me from this position of knowledge it has to be me willing to engage in a dialogue and being teachable and knowing that I'm sometimes going to come out of a panel or come out of, you know, a meeting and realize, oh my gosh, you know, maybe I didn't know as much as I thought I knew, but now that I have this information, how can I adapt that? How can I be inclusive to like, you know, that information and realize, you know, what I didn't know and that I have learned 
will help so many other people. That, that's something that at least in accessibility we, we focus on, on a lot is, is if we focus on the, on the extremes, we're actually going to end up making a, a great design for the people in the middle. Uh, if we focus on how someone who is completely blind is gonna utilize the screen, we're probably gonna help someone who might need help uh, reading subtitles because they just had an eye exam and had the eye dilated, right? So that's how we think about in accessibility. So I love the fact that as you guys can see, uh, this idea of inclusive design is not just focus on UX design or, or uh, or even architecture is, is pretty much just trickles. It is one of the only things that actually does trickle down because this stuff is false. Um, anyone else want to uh, have a stab at what are some of the subjects that we should be really focusing on, or or giving uh, some of the some of the subjects that the students should focus on before before they're out in, in the workspace. I'll add on to to the teachable part a little bit, just um, and just say, um, just speak to the the um, the skill of listening. You know, um, we, in today's society, everyone has a voice with social media and Instagram and Facebook. Everybody wants to speak. You know, everybody has a voice. Everybody wants to speak, and and very few people want to listen to what other people have to say. So um, we only want likes. We don't want dislikes. We want hearts on Instagram. Um, you know, we don't, we don't want to see the things, see the issues and resolve the issues. So one of the things that um, I like to do when designing product is actually look at product reviews and see the things that people hate about product because with with within those reviews lies the opportunity, you know? So um, I just think that people need to be better listeners and focus on listening to other people a lot more. You know, we, we, we run to Instagram every morning to post or run to Facebook to post, but how often do we actually listen to what people are telling us or go to listen to what other people have to say instead of you know, focusing on what we have to share. I think um, I think Instagram hurt you because a lot of people didn't like the last update and they changed it back this morning. So it's true. <laughs> listen, you gotta listen. They yeah. listen. They <laughs> listen. I can't stand it either. I can't wait. I, I didn't know they changed. Like, I can't wait this? to get back on Instagram. I'm like, what is this shopping thing? You're like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> Let me refresh. I'll be right back. No, just. <laughs> I, 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 you look at the reviews on Instagram, a lot of people are, are were saying, this is not a mall. Why is Instagram a shopping design? But it gives you guys a lot. It gives you is, is the insight, right? I think we're, we're really, and I hope you guys are, that are listening are really honing down on the fact that we're, we're really focusing on research and understanding other people's voices and, and, and making sure that we, that the data that we come up with is, is, um, a diverse data that it doesn't just include numbers and, and statistics, but it also includes the reviews and the comments and the anecdotes and the videos and, yeah. and someone's actual and the you know the facial expressions when you ask a question uh, that actually gives you a lot of insight into what the people think. It's, it's, so I really want you guys to to be writing down this 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 blueprint on inclusive design. And right now we are we're heavy heavy on research. Uh, and part of research is uh, listening, listening a lot. You gotta listen a lot. Um, I'd love to add um, a really tangible suggestion for the students. I, I think one of the things, if you can, if you still have courses where you can choose what to take, uh, take courses outside of design, um, particularly mm -hmm. in like anthropology or history, or if, if there's anything around uh, communities um, or co-design with communities, like I think these are, kinds of courses that can give you a real perspective into like doing what everyone's been talking about. And I think design tries to teach some methods of research, but if you really want to understand how to do these things on another level, learning from anthropology or, you know, psychology or history will just totally open up your eyes into like other ways of, of, of approaching problems. Yeah, I would also, I would also add, um, 
I think it's really important to for people to also understand how when I think of inclusive design, I also think of nature um, because design has is why so many of us as people of color are living in dirty neighborhoods. You know, like it's really affected where we live, the quality of air we have access to. I mean, it actually affects the political system tremendously. So I think that people should, um, students should try to uh, get some environmental justice um, stuff down or include environmentalism in their work because it, it, diversity and inclusion intersects directly with the injustice that's been done to, to this planet and, and to, uh, to, uh, to us as people, as marginalized people. Um, and I think that when we're designing, if we also consider the impacts on the planet, like how are we designing in a way that's regenerative, that's sustainable? you know, and that's actually going to um, improve our quality of life, improve the soil, you know, maximize on whatever elements, whether it's like sunlight or just how do we work with the planet? Because I think so often um, really colonialism and white supremacy has taught us to dominate nature, just like we dominate people. And so um, getting into right relationship also means um, including the the environment, so I, I encourage students to like, you know, get some get get in, in, include some good environmentalism in your studies as well. That's that's a that's a, that's a very uh, I think one notion that we don't focus enough is is how where we design like physically where where the where the experience is happening is being affected. Uh, and where this space of, of nuance is happening, literally the space is being affected and, and how is the overpopulation of cities because that's where, you know, the, the biggest, right? The Seattle, the San Francisco, the Palo Alto, the New York, how is the, how is centering the designs, right? The makeup of designs, how is that affecting the space that we are living? How is that affecting uh, the population in the Bronx with the highest level of asthma in the United States. Uh, how is that affecting um, the resources that we give in other spaces of the United States? And I think that that's something at least that this year we're, we're realizing and cities are realizing that uh, we need to trickle down the, the population so that the cities are not so hardly affected. Um, I, I lived in Seattle, Washington when I worked at Amazon and the, the people who are from Seattle had really, really negative things to say about um, Amazon creating so many buildings because they, they were like, well, this used to be a park. There used to be more nature around the city. There used to be more birds around the city. And now it's all just jungle, uh, concrete jungle. And, and it's very damaging. You cannot even see the sun. They were really, really uh, sad about the change of their city based on one company and the innovation of that company. Um, so I think it's a, it's, I'm very interested to see the shift of the eco center of, of design and how we're not, we're going to have mechas of design in, in places that we didn't even think about before. And I think um, that's, that's, that's one aspect that is not being very, very uh, hung down. So I love that. Thank you, Fabiana, for bringing that up. Um, anyone else have any ideas or any Anything else to give our, our students on inclusive design? Well, I think um, I, I wanted to go back to a point that was that was brought up a few ago. Um, on on and I have I'm looking at the take my notes uh, on how to be a leader in the space without being the center of, of, of the space. And I think we have, we had a great uh, question from the audience that, that talked about uh, leadership and, and the, toxic, the toxicity behind this. Um, do you guys think that a more horizontal or democratic organization of the workplace would allow for, for people in those workplace to have more voice uh, to have a stronger voice uh, or their voice to be heard. Uh, if we have organizations where the where leadership is not at the core of innovation, 
uh, but rather just everybody is the same. And is, is that even feasible? Or although design actually requires people to be leaders for it to advance? Um, okay. When I think about all any of like the, you know, employment situations or, you know, jobs that I've had where I've done well, um, it's always been, always, always has been because the person that I worked for, like my boss, um, empowered me. And like, you know, I think the mark of good leadership is empowerment um, to make the people under you feel that, you know, feel like their innovation is a necessary part of what you're doing. Um, I think that really matters is like, you know, no one wants to be in, you know, a work situation which they, you know, dread it. And like, why do you dread, um, you know, or, or, you know, feel that they're not being heard. So like, you know, having a environment where people are empowered and like, you know, how that looks and, you know, especially in this particular climate where, you know, you see diversity, inclusion groups popping up all over. And, you know, that's been such like a thing that's been like being pushed within like different, you know, work environments. But um, it also makes me wonder if this is a priority, like now to the point that you've had, you've decided to make a, a, you know, a committee or a group around it, then that means that you need to like admit that, you know, prior to that you were complicit in a kind of environment that wasn't empowering to its employees. Mm. And then like, you know, beyond like, you know, addressing, you have to address how you, how you failed people and, you mm. know, the ways in which you want to correct that so people can succeed. Um, that looks different for every, you know. I think we have a problem with your audio. I think so. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. I'm sorry. Um, and that looks different, you know, like in, you know, it looks different everywhere. However, um, it starts with being someone who isn't attached to, you know, that title. There was something, you know, that I've seen somewhere and something my grandmother always told me too, is that, you know, never get too tied to a position or a job title or something because that won't hold you, that won't keep you. But, you know, if you are aligned with that mission and you are, you know, aligned with the fundamentals, that will help you no matter what it is that you're doing. So you're saying either you have two options and I would love if anyone can uh, iterate on this one. Um, you have two options. You either have a great leader that empowers you or you have to regardless of the environment where you are, you have to find a way to empower yourself by committing to the cause that you're doing. Yes. Is that, where, is that yeah. something that reflects to anyone else in the panel? You may not have that empowering um, person outside of yourself. So yes, that should always come from within, definitely. It's better mm -hmm. if you have both. <laughs> right. But. Yeah. Uh I, you know, just adding on to that, I think leadership is important just from a strategy standpoint and just knowing where you're going as a team, as an organization. I think where leadership becomes an issue is where is in situations where the leadership has been put in place, not because of merit, but because of favoritism or, um, you know, nepotism or something like that. But I think the great leaders have been through the fire and can lead their team through difficult situations and, and you know, and um, they have that experience. And then um, to Kayla's point, great leaders also empower their team and they want to see their team succeed. Leadership is a, it's, it's about serving other people. It's not about, you know, commanding and controlling people and telling them what to do. It's about empowering people with the tools and the strategies they need to be successful, you know? And um, a lot of times, um, oftentimes people confuse leadership with um, just a title or, or, or making it to a certain position when there's actually a lot of, of uh, you know, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with leadership. Um, you know, people often 
take hits at, at, at people in leadership positions, CEOs or whatnot, but can you imagine having the responsibility of making sure uh, 200,000 people have a job to go home to feed their family? You know, you have, like, it's a big thing. And I think that um, it's needed, but great leaders serve the people who they lead. I would agree that um, leadership is very important, right? To keep people, uh, as Clayvon said, it's about you know taking care of your employees and to provide the vision. I, I think in design in particular, though, we have an issue with this myth of the lone genius, right? Like whether it's mm -hmm. Steve Jobs or you know I'm thinking of, of several architects. Um, and I know when I was in school. Um, when I was in architecture school, we were always given these great, always white men, great men to look up to, right? And said, well, they're a genius. They did this piece of architecture, whatever. And then when you go out in the working world and maybe you're working for one of these people, you realize these visions are built on the labor of so many other people that are there, right? There actually is no lone genius. So there's, um, there's quite a few people um, behind them. And so I think, uh, I hope this is a shift of how we think of leadership as well. I think the, a, a great leader is one that's a great facilitator. And I think that's a skill that designers have, right? Especially if you're accounting for all these different voices at the table. Um, and I think where designers can contribute the most is to be a great synthesizer, right? How do you take all of this information um, that you have from all of these other voices and, and how do you get to um, a solution and a way forward. And, and to me, I think those are those are much more valuable skills in, in leadership. That's what makes a great leader. Yeah, from, from my uh, experience, I, I've worked at a ton of startups and startups like to say like, oh, we're a flat meritocracy. Uh, and it actually just creates like a very toxic environment um, where people in power actually just retain power by not having any leaders uh, in the organization. Um, and so, you know, in theory, it can sound nice, but in the workplace, uh, it can actually, uh, work counter to what, like Kayla, for example, was saying is like having someone that can advocate for you because at any point that person in power, it will just like overturn anything that the people have decided. Um, so it can sound nice in theory, but, um, in the, in the workplace, I think Kayla was saying this, like, it's a, you want both. You want both a, a, a manager or a leader that can advocate for you and be able to have people like voice their opinions. But without, uh, I would say there's always a structure. Uh, even if people try to hide it, there's always a, a power play. So having it more explicit, I think helps a lot. Yeah, yeah that this, um, I think, I think it's interesting that, that we're, we're talking about the fact that, you know, we sometimes going to need someone to push us uh, because I think right now a lot of the students are looking at themselves and are saying well I I just graduated school and I'm just about to uh, embark in finding a job or, or about to get an internship or about to go into my first job um, but what I'm I want to be a, a leader uh, anyhow you know and I think I think a lot of people don't realize that in order to be a leader, you don't really need to be in a management position. Uh, as Kayla said, you just need to empower users and empowering the people that you're working uh, either with or for is, is a way to be a leader. Uh, even if you don't have the title of lead of, of management, you, you, have little, you have power within the role that you're getting uh, because you're at it. And I think that that's something that our students can get, you know, of course, aspire if that's what you want, aspire to go up the ladder, uh, but know that you are a leader in your space as soon as you step on it, regardless of how many years, so how much experience you might have. Um, if you're, you're helping others get what they need to get, you're a leader in this space. Um, and I think that's a little bit of confidence boost to the to the uh, new students that are coming out. And I think they're gonna, they need it, especially in these times. Um, I, because, you know, it, it's, it's a very interesting space to, to get out and start working. And I wanted to, I have, I had a very interesting question right here from the audience talking about uh, finding jobs right out of college. 
And I think that the times that chimes in a lot on leadership and, and having people to advocate for you. Um, how to find jobs is very diverse based on the space that you are and, and, the, and what you need to get a job. But I think I would love to ask the audience, um, since we're still hanging on students, um, what are your, your suggestions or advices on people uh, to showcase uh, once they get a job? What should be the, the thing that they should uh, immediately try to get across in the space? Uh, for example, for me, I tell, I tell women, I tell especially women, uh, do not be afraid to speak up in meetings uh, or intersect. Uh, I work in a bank. Bank is very male heavy, very white, above 45 is a hello. So I always tell uh, the people that are in my team, uh, the people that I lead, I tell them, don't be afraid to interrupt because sometimes people won't shut up unless you make them. So I always tell them, if you feel like you have something to say and, and someone is not letting you say, uh, speak up. And so some of, those are some of the things that, that are in adding to having an inclusive space, an inclusive uh, workplace. And I wanted to know what are, your, what are your suggestions that either you tell yourself or you've told yourself or you tell the people that you mentor or the people that you lead when it comes to, to getting there at the beginning of the job, what they should focus on once to get a job. Um, I, so I think first, um, experience is important. And I think, you know, I, 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 I'm hiring, um, I just went through a hiring process and um, I was actually looking for a, a digital social media manager for my organization. Um, but a few things. So first is that as maybe you don't have experience with something that you're applying for, but you do have another experience. And specifically, I know as young people, um, I mean, a lot of us are young, but you know what I mean? As, as younger people, y'all have, you, you all know digital media. You, bear, you know, you guys know social media. Um, you maybe, you know how to produce content. So I think first is to um, get your skills up around, um, around um, the things that help you push out your message, right? I think that because of COVID, um, we're moving, we, we have been moving into an, an immensely digital space and that's gonna be the reality for a few years. Um, so I think first lean on your, your strengths and learn how to talk about them. And second is I would say do your own projects because you know, when, I, when I'm hiring, I do look for experience. You know, and I want to, sometimes that comes in, you know, somebody who, you know, noticed that there was, for example, um, uh, somebody made their own uh, um, project on Instagram where they raided um, uh, bars in the San Francisco Bay Area around how inclusive they were. And they ended up making a whole site, I mean, excuse me, a whole account that really grew in popularity. So that's an example of a self-initiated project. So I would say like you got you do got to have have examples that that um, point at your what you offer, but you got to you got to kind of package them right and you also got to do them, you know, so mm -hmm. it does, you don't have to necessarily work for someone else, but you do have to have experience in organizing things, you know, events, um, writing, right, copywriting, digital media. Uh, I, I think that just lean on your strengths so that at least you can get into the door. Um, in an organization, because once you're in an organization or a company, it's then easier for you to then, you know, get mentored and 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 kind of move your way up. I, I love that because a lot of students are right now focusing on the fact that, you know, that that toxic uh, circle of um, I'm looking for a job and the job requires experience. And I'm not getting hired, so I'm not getting experience. So I keep looking for a job. But, but this, this is a very toxicity. And I think I, I love that. I love that you're pointing the fact that you don't really need to be hired somewhere else to have experience on the work that you want to do. Yeah. And I love. I, I know that there's people watching who are right now looking at how to create a new Instagram account for the work that they're going to do. Because I think that's that's a that's a great call out. And 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 I it's not just about our internships. 
experience can be found in a lot of places and, and we have the ability, the majority of us with cell phones to create our own version of experience in our own way. Yeah. Uh, and I think the, the part that the companies like the most, especially the companies that are, you know, the big, the biggest ones, right? I'm not trying to advertise nobody, but the big companies are looking for, for that to not just to have a specific type of experience, but how are, how are you thinking, right? If, if you can get work, well, how are you doing the problem solving of trying to get your own experience and you came out with an Instagram account, that's awesome. Or a Medium page or LinkedIn, whatever, or a YouTube page, or I mean, I can, or Behance, Dribbble. Uh, I'm trying to remember all the things that I use. It's like, you can get experience by creating your own uh, and not depending on somebody else hiring you to get it. That's one way to break the cycle. Um, so I love, I love that fact. Anyone else have any uh, opinions on or advices on these nuance of today and, and how to get, um, what to get once you are into the door or before you get into the door? Um, before you like begin that whole process of, you know, finding the job and, you know, looking for the in internship or however, I think, um, what was helpful for me was that I took some time to like really strategize on what I actually wanted. Um, and I, and I created a plan, you know, I looked at some, some people in my field that I admired, you know, and for me, it was like, you know, I looked, number one, I looked for people who look like me, because I know there's not a lot of people who look like me who do what I do. You know, it's a small community. It's literally, and it used to, I used to feel that, oh my God, I'm never going to meet these people. And now these people are like two degrees of separation from me because, you know, I was able to strategize. And what I did was like, I thought about what I really wanted, you know, what kind of work I wanted to do and how I wanted that work to live in the world um, from there. And then also, you know, taking, you know, my own account of my experiences, you know, entering into my particular field um, and being mindful of that. Like, you know, if I experienced something that was like extremely negative, I would think about, you know, what are some ways to counteract that? Um, or, you know, when applying to some for positions, think about what, and this is actually something, a discussion that um, I've been having in another um, circle is how did other people before me fare, you know, who look like me? Because I, I know when I am entering into any room, you know, unfortunately, I may be the only person who looks like me in that room. And my goal is to not be the only person like me anywhere. Like my goal is to create a platform that other people can join. Um, and won't be intimidated by. So, you know, I think about all those things, but strategy helped me, you know, plan, you know, where, you know, I wanted to go and the things that I want to do in the future. And that's always something that I'm constantly working on, like strategizing, re-strategizing, setting goals, you know, and setting boundaries, like what I will and will not accept helped me, you know, plot something. And something that Faviana said that, you know, resonated with me so strongly because I did it too, was being willing to step outside of, you know, that mainstream or, you know, doing things for myself. I did a lot of independent projects, a lot of freelance projects um, and recognizing that, you know, and also I was working in alternative art spaces. You know, that is a whole like situation that may not be as, you know, prominent as, you know, institutional work, but it actually is because when you're working in an alternative space, you are doing way more things than you ever, like a person, you know, in a museum who has a department that does, you know, just that one thing that you want to do. But when you're working in, you know, an alternative space, you are that person who does all the things, you know, so being willing to take a chance for yourself and step outside of that known course when you're like setting your goals and strategizing the career that you want. Um, then, then, and this is for anyone in the brand, then um, what do you think is, because it, it's different, right? When, when we first started looking for jobs, we were in, in the environment that we are right now. Uh, it, was, it was different. And so I, I wanna know what do you think are, are, are the biggest difference between 
I guess our personal generation and our our idea of a career path to the opportunities and the possibilities be, beyond just social media that these new students of today have. Uh, I really want to, you know, because we're not we're, we're it's different. So I really want people to kind of understand that perhaps the methods of yesterday are not going to be very valid today. So I really want to know what do you think is the difference uh, between our generations and then generation coming up? And um, I think what is their strength and, and how is their generation uniquely uh, positioned for what's going to happen in tomorrow? Uh, w one thing I could share is that, um, you know, like, like Clavon, I, I uh, studied industrial design, but when I was coming out of school, uh, finishing my master's in 2014, there wasn't a lot of industrial design jobs to be found. Um, and so it was definitely from the market and like trying to find a job that I found myself in tech, not necessarily because I wanted to, but because it was sort of the reality of like where I could find jobs and, and make a living. Um, and so that, that's something like that. I'm not sure I'm like totally comfortable with, but it's the sort of reality of like, um, I would love to be working on, on something, but also trying to figure out how to make a living it is uh, definitely a challenge, but I, I think I've been able to stay true to like sort of like the core problem solving and design skills. And so it was a, a shift of what I, I thought I'd be working on, but not like a complete career change into like something different, you know, learning, I had to learn some, some digital skills that were a bit different, but really sort of applying the same approach that I, I learned in school. Um, so I think that's a bit of maybe what Fabiano was saying and sort of the discussion led is like, maybe we're at a, another shift of even, even becoming more digital uh, than it was when, in 2014. So um, I, I think it's definitely a reality. Yeah. Okay. No, I just. Uh, um, I was just gonna uh, let you know that um, if Fabiana is going to have to step out for a little bit because she's gonna do what all of us should be doing every time, and is getting tested. So thank you for doing your social duties. Uh, thank you for participating, Fabiana. Um, uh, and yes, Clayhorn, please. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, it's okay. What I what my thing is with this generation, I think they're dealing with one of the, the one of the biggest challenges with this generation is the ability to focus. Like there are so many tools and so many, so much information being blasted at this generation and so many options that it's I, I can just see it's it's just so hard for for them to focus. So um I would just challenge them to really hunker down for, I don't know, you know, three to four months and focus on what they're doing, like no social media, no binge watching shows on Netflix or anything. You know, it's like um, I was watching TV last night, which I rarely do, but I just remember the time when you had to wait for your TV show to come on TV. You know, now you can go watch it instantly and you can go watch six seasons 30 episodes of it if you want to and you just you it's you it's so easy to get distracted in in today's day and age so um find a way to focus on what you have to do focus on your task at hand focus on that side project that you're trying to work on to get the job like really hunger lock yourself down and focus on what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish until you succeed. I'm, 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 I'm gonna take that with me because I've been watching uh, The Crown <laughs> and I should have. <laughs> I've been watching a lot. It's a great show, guys. The Crown, it's a great show. Uh, and The Queen Gambits too. I watch too much Netflix, I need to. Oh, uh, <laughs> there's, that's that's there's really something going on all the time. I mean, the Instagram, Instagram timeline is a never ending reel of things to catch your, get your attention, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing with the Facebook timeline. It's a never ending reel of posts to engage you into commenting and going back and forth with somebody about an issue online. And then before you know it, you look at it and 
two hours have gone by and you could have spent that two hours working on that project. I love, no, I, I, I do you, I, I know I, I joke a lot, but you are completely right. I think, you know, sometimes we need to make sure that we don't get, um, I mean, distraction, if social media is a distraction for you, then maybe delete that app for a little bit. If YouTube is, you know, like whatever distraction is, because I think the difference between our generation and the new one is that they grew up with it. So perhaps it's not as much of a distraction for them into, uh, it's not a much of a distraction for them because this is their normal and perhaps some other spaces in their life is a distraction. So I think, you know, find out what it is that it is your, your uh, Achilles and, and, and try to make sure that you focus on what it is that you want to do and, and get your, get your paper, get your paper. Um, <laughs> I guess I, I love, I love this, this, this conversation, I really love the fact that we're showing people from different perspectives how to be better employees, how to, to be better coworkers, how to be better designers, how to be uh, better thinkers, um, just by by being true to themselves and and to to being true to the work that they're trying to to do. And I want to ask the the panel one last question. Um, and this is gonna be a, a very interesting. What do you think is your personal contribution uh, to the next generation and to the work for the next generation? Your personal. I, I'll go, I guess. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just think to the next generation, I, I just want to be, um, you know, a representation of of someone who came from the backwoods, small town, small house, humble beginnings to, to pursue my dreams and make my dreams a reality. And I think that my contribution to them is to let them know and show them that they can really be anything that they want to be and they really have to put forward the effort to get to where they want to be in life um and to me that's just like i guess empowering the next generation is what i'm i'm looking to do is empower the next generation to achieve their dreams in life i love that i love that uh, uh, i'm gonna ask uh, 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 Kayla, what is, um, if you want to go in, I'm going to just call out people because that, that, that makes it more spicy. So Kayla, what, uh, what do you think is, is your personal contribution for the next generation and the places that they will inherit? Um, that's actually a really hard question because I feel like I'm, uh, you know, this is something that I'm still doing currently and I'm still like, you know, knee deep in the work and I'm young. Um, but I think that, you know, I hope that, that, you know, people will see me and, and want to do it too, you know, or want to get involved too. Um, participation is important and also rep like, you know, as Clayvon said, representation um, and that, you know, these things aren't unaccessible. Um, there's so often that, you know, we think that, or, you know, there is, this kind of narrative that certain things are out of reach and nothing is out of reach. You can do anything that you want. Um, so yeah, being able, like if this is whatever it is, you wanna do design, you wanna do art, however you want to, you know, you know, exercise that creative muscle, um, you can do it. There's definitely room for that. Um, and there's room for all perspectives. And I think if someone can learn that through me, then great. I love that. Um, Sada. Yeah, I mean, well, first off, just on a personal level, um, I have I have three kids. I have three kids, six and under, and I, I keep saying, and I know this is weird um, as a professor, but it doesn't, I just want them to know it doesn't matter to me if they, you know, if they go to the best college or, you know, have a, you know, what's considered a high powered career. I just want them to be good humans and take care of the earth. <laughs> right? That's, 
that's my number, those are my two priorities uh, for them. And so um, that's, again, that's on a personal level. I feel like to my students and um, to the people I work with, again, I, I think um, what I just try to do is make sure to let them know that their perspectives and experiences are valid, right? Because I feel like when I was growing up, I'm biracial, right? And I always felt like I had to pick one or the other growing up right, or actually, or sort of anonymize myself. And I think what I've tried to do in, um, with my students is um, have them take the self-reflection, have them understand their identity, have them understand their experiences and, and let them and try and facilitate pouring that um, into their designs. But I have to say with this generation, it's actually very easy because they're, like, they're actually quite sure of, of who they are. So uh, it's not a difficult task, but I, I keep trying to remind myself how it felt for me sometimes um, and, um, and uh, just bring that to my students as well. I love that. Um, Isan. Sure. Um, I think for me, my contribution, I, I sort of mentioned this uh, during my lecture is uh, I sort of reflected on a lot of the work that I've been doing and put together this website um, called Wider Interface. Um, and it's really sort of meant for like product designers and digital designers and like trying to <laughs> encourage them to focus less on the trends, like focus less on the border radii or like what's the ne neatest shadow or gradient. Because um, I, I think a lot of like digital designers get caught up in these like trends. And realize that there's like a history to all this stuff that's happened. Cause I, I think a lot of uh, things in like um, digital design are like ahistorical. Like I think the other design fields are much better about history. Um, but when it comes to digital design, we just sort of assume that like, um, you know, every, every problem that we're solving is like the first time that this thing has ever been done before and sort of forget like the impact it has on people or society. Um, and so just really these reminders of like, don't get stuck in the fads um, and really think deeply about like, you know, for example, one example is like, okay, you know, there's a food delivery app. What impact does that have on society? And like really thinking deeply about that. Um, that's just like one example. But when you, when you think about a lot of these things, like you might just think like, oh, just designing an interface to do something. But uh, I think over time we're realizing that like, okay, having a social media app or food delivery app can have like huge impacts on, on society. Uh, and it's not just like what it looks like or, or button moved, you know, I think like, for example, like with Instagram, the button moving is less about the button moving and more about like, what is Instagram becoming? Like Instagram was maybe about like sharing pictures with family and friends. And now like it's upsetting because Instagram is telling, you, no, it's about you buying stuff. No, I, I, I just love to begin on on everyone. I think that the fact that you guys are are kind of like summarizing what all you guys said was um, to understand that you don't have to come from privilege to achieve what it is that you want to achieve, uh, and also understanding that there's no a level of success that success is very personal. And, and whatever it is that you want to do um, is your version of success and whatever university you attend and whatever you or whatever university do, you do not attend or whatever uh, route of life you want to go, that's your version of success. And, and also, I, I love that you said, you know, I'm, I'm still young, I'm still working, but I think that's also very important for, for the generation to notice is that uh, the work never ends and you could be in the middle of it and then still look and say, okay, I still have so much more to do, uh, even though I have done so much. So I think I, I wanna, especially I have cousins who are just about to graduate and starting the work and I see them as extremely overwhelmed because they're like, oh, I'm, I'm 21. I should already been done X, Y, and Z uh, because yeah, social media has a lot of impact on, on, on the reality of people. So I love the fact that that Kayla, you 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 mentioned that the work is never done, uh, and you're constantly aspiring to do better and to be better. And and I love that that's that in and of itself is a great example for for the generation for them to know that that both their 
their current situation is not going to be their permanent reality and that their reality is shifted completely all like shifted depending on where you are and 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 as that you said you know what i started from school is not what i'm doing right now and i also want the the audience to to realize that that is not uncommon and that the majority of people that go and study something don't end up working in the space that they're studying i went to school for writing and i'm a vice president of ux design uh, so it's, it's not uncommon to both not know what it is that you want to do for the next 50 years of your life and also to start something and then make a pivot and go somewhere else because you found a new passion and um, so i really really want uh, to thank you all of you guys because those are excellent excellent advice for for the new generation and and for me i think that's you know you guys are are uh, members of the spaces in design that we all interact with and and i admire all of you guys and and your thinking and your contribution into these spaces and um, and with that i want to to thank you guys, the audience, for listening, for sending your questions. Uh, this has been a long road uh, with so many panelists and so many lectures. And I know that all of you guys got so much information from it. Um, I know that you guys are looking at, you know, what to do next. And these are very well, very, very good um, methods of research. Uh, is listening to how other people have done it and picking and choosing what what you can use for your own space. So I really, really thank you guys for, for listening, um, for spending your lunch time, depending on the time zone that you are with us. And I want to thank Lehman College for bringing all of us together one last time for the, at least for 2020, uh, before we go to the holidays and, and end up in, in such a great note on, you know, diversity means your voice is needed. And, and that's, that's what I want to close it and give it, give the, the mic back to David. Great. Thank you, everybody. That was, um, that was incredible. I, I think I actually must watch, watch this again, like later, just to refresh, you know, because I was like so inspired by every point that people were making, even about my own life choices. I was <laughs> feeling like a little better about how I had sort of, you know, conducted myself and my career. So thank you again. I also just want to thank the, the Sarah Little Turnbull Foundation again for a lot of funding this and allowing us to have this really great speaker series and Dorothy uh, Dunn from the foundation. Thanks so much again. Uh, uh, and thanks again to Bart and Deborah in the gallery for helping make this possible and everybody else who's been involved and all of you panelists. Everybody have a great uh, rest of your afternoon and a great holiday. And uh, hopefully we come out on the new year um, healthier and happier than we uh, began this year, okay? We wanna know, they wanna know when will the recording be oh, available? Yes, the, uh, uh, the recordings are usually available within, I wanna say two to three days. So uh, and they'll, they'll all, they're all available at the uh, Lehman College Art Gallery website. They have a YouTube channel and that's where they'll all be available for sure, so. Great. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much for speaking. Uh, uh, I will miss this series yeah. for sure. Thank Looking you so much. Looking forward to 2021 in, in more than one way. <laughs> yeah.